All right, let's start all over. Good morning, everybody. I forgot I was muted. EGIF. Today we are here for the May recap of all the applications. Feel free to ask questions by either unmuting yourself like I did not and speaking up or sending a message through chat. So let's start on the wiki at the bottom of this main page um, where you registered for meetings and trainings. This is where you registered and where you can find the recording later. At the bottom of this page, you'll find the release recaps, which for the, this year, all of the applications are on one page for May. So we'll click on May. We're gonna start with the USAS releases, which in May, there were two releases and one hot fix. And on these releases, the developers implemented some performance uh, improvements that should be noticeable on some of these canned reports that are based on the activity ledger. And the goal here is to get these uh, performing at 100% or 110% so that users use these versus the template reports on the, under the report manager. So the performance improvement was on activity ledger reports, such as the financial detail or the account activity, which is like the budget account activity or the revenue account activity. And you can see in addition to some of the improvements is now that you can use your wild cards and when you're sorting by CSV and PDF and other formats, you have these sortable properties with, with the CSV, you now have, well, when it's, I'm sorry, when it's generated on the CSV, you now have that forecast line, which many of the users have requested. So here's an example of the report generated um, with the object code of two. Oops. And then when I generated it, it showed the uh, five-year forecast line. Okay. There are still further improvements on both of these budget and revenue um, count activity reports as well. Another improvement was when the month closes and it generates those report bundles, the outstanding reports like the outstanding disbursement report and the outstanding purchase order reports are now going to reflect um, not just that month of April, like I'm looking here, it's going to reflect all time through April. So I generated these after the update. And you can see that there's no like beginning date, but there is an end date. So everything through April 30th, and this is this demo database, and we have a lot of data that, so you can see though, that every purchase order, even back to 2012, are on this report like it should be, not just April. So that was an improvement. And then across all applications, there was a problem with the duo implementation that was causing performance um, issues. And then there was an error that when, I think I had, yeah. An error was fixed when the user performed an account change that involved revenue accounts that included a refund on that revenue account. And this is the message. It was actually like, I'm looking at this one. It is a revenue account, but the message here before this is corrected was it couldn't, it threw the expenditure account in the air. So that's been corrected. And, 
That is all I have for you, Sass. So next up is USPS recaps. Okay. Everybody see my screen okay? For some reason it looks different. Give me one second. Can you guys can you guys see my screen? Yeah, that looks okay. Okay, all right, perfect. Usually it's highlighted and for some reason it's not, but it might just be the way I'm looking at it. Okay. Um, so we did have several hot fixes um, that went out and we also had um, a couple regular releases um, when, when it comes to the payroll side. And most of the hot fixes were re related to remnants from um, the 6.90 regular release where um, we took the building and department codes and moved them from custom fields to um, its own object. So who could have thought a couple little you know, fields could cause so many um, problems? But you'll see several of the hot fixes were related to um, implementing the building and department um, object. So um, the first one being, um, we did have a limit on the characters that the codes could um, be, and that limit was 10 characters. Um, that has now been increased to 255. So, um, you know, there should be no... Um, errors caused when those codes reach characters past that previous limit of 10. Um, the employee master report um, now includes employees that even if they haven't been paid. So what's nice about this is I know a lot of districts, you know, we're approaching summer and new hires, and they like to get those um, empl new employees entered in the system ahead of time as they're board approved. And then they run that employee master report to verify and make sure everything looks good um, before they're even paid. Well, if they weren't prior to this update, um, if they weren't paid in the system, they wouldn't be um, included in the employee master report at all. So that has now been um, enhanced and changed. And so now you know, districts can run that report and verify the, that new, newly entered employee information, even if they haven't been paid yet in the system. So a nice, a nice feature or enhancement there. Um, we did have a problem with the earnings register, um, including imported deferred docs in the doc total. Um, so that has been corrected. So again, you know, I want to emphasize this was just for imported deferred docs. So probably not you know, real common, but if you're running that for, you know, dates in the past, um, that that issue has been corrected. Um, we had an issue with the earnings register um, failing when there were um, position payments for zero amounts. We had a couple reports of this, and the developers are still looking into how this even happened. Um, and basically, positions were included in the payroll that were, um, you know, not something that was, um, had been happening before, and they were added with zero dollar amounts, which we have yet to be able to reproduce this and try to, you know, narrow down how it even happened. So the, um, the correction was to just void those payments um, so that they, you know, don't cause problems in the future, even though they're dollar amounts. But in return, um, a 
downside of that was if those payments were included in a date range for and um, for on the earnings register, then the report itself was failing. So, you know, again, very um, situation specific. And we did just have only had a couple of reports of that. The developers are still looking into it. But at any rate, the earnings register has been updated and those um, you know, special situation should no longer cause the report to fail. Um, again, uh, with um, the the release um, that went out that um, was correcting some things for the building and department code issues, um, I think it was the 6.91 release. Um, we had, uh, you know, that release went out and then we had a flood of of emails come in, um, tickets come in saying that districts were not able to view and or edit positions. Um, so um, a hotfix went out then to correct that as you know as quickly as possible so that districts were able to you know view and edit positions as they as they would um, uh, any other time. And then, as Pat mentioned, there was a problem with the um, duo that was um, causing issues across all applications. So, as she mentioned, it was corrected for USAS. It was also corrected for payroll. Um, so that um, issue should no longer um, be causing performance issues. Moving on to the improvements, um, we did um, update an error um, when a payroll item maximum is reached. And that warning that was always produced on the um, pay report um, will now only be produced the first time that maximum has been reached. So, you know, now we're kind of getting to the time, you know, over the summer months where maybe they're only withholding um, certain payroll items throughout the school year. And those maximums are, are getting, you know, are reached. So what would happen prior to this enhancement was, you know, every payroll after that, the warning would appear on the pay um, on the air report. So kind of, you know, redundant, not really maybe necessary. And it kind of makes that air report a little cumbersome. Um, so now rest assured that it's only going to list that warning on the air report the first time the maximum was reached. And then after that, it falls off the report and you, you know, will no longer see it. Um, when it comes to changing um, the pay unit um, on the leaves um, ob screen. Um, so if you're changing, you know, an employee from daily to hourly or vice versa, um, the balance was always being um, recalculated. But now we've taken that one step further and it will also recalculate the accumulation per month, the maximum leave amount, um, the reset value, and then when it comes to sick leave, just that um, maximum advance leave amount. So all of those parts that pertain to, you know, the changing of that pay unit are, are getting recalculated as well and not just the balance. Okay. Um, when it comes to the single object audit report for position, um, we now have um, the uh, um, ability to see um, the actual code itself on the audit report versus the database ID. Database ID doesn't really mean, you know, as much um, at a quick glance as just the old value being you know the number or the the actual value and then the new value being what you changed it to okay i had a question what is the check leave report name okay we're going to get to that tammy in just a minute if you don't mind me revisiting your question and we'll we'll circle back to that if that's okay all right um, so again, the um, on the position audit report, and again, anytime we talk about the single object audit report, that just means going to that um, specific employee or, you know, going to that object and then selecting that object, or I'm sorry, viewing 
that employee's record and then selecting the actual audit report from the screen. So instead of going to reports and then audit report, um, we're gonna you know, just run an audit report for this single object for this employee. Okay, so that's what we mean when we talk about single object audit reports. Okay, um, moving on, you can now sort the new contract grid by either the type or contract days. So if I go to processing and then new contracts, um, you can see here I have several different um, new contracts entered in the maintenance option. You can view those. We can now then filter based on contract days. So if I just wanna get a report based on everybody that has you know, a contract of 260 days, 184, whatever it might be. Um, I can also then filter based on the type. So if I start typing um, any part of that type, it then filters my grid accordingly and I can, you know, generate a report, you know, glance at the grid, um, whatever it may be, um, to make it easier to, to look at what you're wanting to. Okay. So two new features um, when it comes to, to filtering um, um, on the grid um, for new contracts. We also added a prefix to the um, new object, the building and department object to differentiate between those two on the grid. So we had reports of, you know, hey, if I go to the position grid, and I add the department code and I add the position code, you know, probably you can tell by the codes themselves, but it's not very helpful that they both are, you know, the, the column heading, the field name is both, are both code. So we've now changed that. Um, so if you add those columns to your grid, it's, it is, you know, easy to identify, hey, this is the building um, code column and this is the department code column. Okay. All right. Um, not quite that time yet, but um, our developers are, you know, thinking ahead of, ahead of the game. And we had several um, inquiries after calendar year end about um, having the ability to truncate social security numbers um, when it comes to W-2 reporting. Um, so keep in mind, um, this enhancement does just that. Um, it is only going to truncate the W-2, um, I'm sorry, the Social Security number on the W-2 form and the W-2 XML. Um, so just those two options, the report and the submission file will contain the employee's full Social Security number. Okay, so... Um, when you're looking at the report, if you say, hey, you know, I still see their social security number, that's because the report and then the submission because it's required to um, include the full uh, social security number, those two options, you know, won't, won't be touched. What controls that is a new, a new option on the W, on um, a new option within W2 configuration. So if I go to system, configuration, W2 configuration, you're gonna see here, um, there's a prompt that says, include only last four digits of an employee's social security number on the form and the XML output. So there is a tool tip there um, that also, you know, further defines, you know, what that checkbox is actually doing. Um, so you can hover over that and, you know, it brings up that nice tool tip. So if this box is checked, then again, it's doing, it's going to truncate the W, the social security number to be the last four digits um, on the form and the X amount. So I've generated here um, a couple reports. So you can see here that, and this is a poor example, and I apologize because we don't, in our test instances, we don't have true, you know, social security numbers. So they're all going to be zero. However, they will be listed out, you know, in full. Um, 
On the contrary then, because that checkbox on the configuration screen is checked, you can see here an example then of it truncating and only listing the last four um, of this, you know, on the actual W-2 forms themselves, okay? Okay, so tooltip states last instead of list. Okay, we'll have to make note of that and should only. Okay, all right. Thank you so much for pointing that out. We will make note of that and pass that along. So we'll get that fixed. Thank you. Okay. All right, moving right along. Um, we did have um, a, a, an issue with the placement of the, the salary notice button um, when it comes to in not having the mass change option enabled. Um, it sort of moved the salary notice option on the screen and it was, it was very um, kind of over on top of some other information. Um, so that now um, has been corrected. So it's going to stay in the same place where you would, you know, see it um, on the compensation screen, whether the mass change option is enabled or disabled. So um, either way, that's going to stay at the top of the screen where, you know, where it should be and um, easily located. Okay, moving right along then to... Um, a couple new features. Um, one actually that we're gonna um, touch upon in a little detail, and that's what was asked before, um, and that's the new um, check leave, um, classics check leave replacement. Um, we've now implemented that in um, the redesign, and that's called the leave report. So um, if you remember the check leave report in classic, was a report that districts could run and it had to be run you know, at a specific time within the payroll process um, and it lists balances that were being um, used, I'm sorry, the amount used and then the balances for the various types of leave just pertaining to that payroll. So districts like to run that report after they've, um, you know, they've run up, they've entered all their absences, they've checked it, you know, and now they're, running the payroll, they want to check it one more time. So they run ran the check leave report, double checked their their leave um, at that time, and then they would continue on in the payroll process. So that we didn't have, you know, a, a means to really do that easily um, in the redesign um, until now. So you will notice that when a payroll is in progress, and I have one here, that you'll see this new check leave replacement and it's called leave report. So I have run this. And again, I just have this, you know, absences for one employee. Obviously, you know, district's gonna have multiple. Um, so they're gonna see, you know, all their employees listed with totals at the bottom reflecting, you know, their entire payroll. But um, I think this report looks so pretty. I love the new styles, you know, that the style that the developers are using to when they're um, implementing these reports. Very easy on the eyes to read. Um, and yeah, I just love the way it looks. So hopefully um, districts will like this as well. I know they've been looking forward to this for quite some time. Um, the other nice feature is once the payroll is posted, um, you're also going to see this report. So um, you'll see the leave report prior to posting. And then once it's posted, you'll see the report listed again. Um, so, you know, it's always available to them to go back to and reference. Um, I did add a comment um, that we have had requests then to take this one step further and add this report to um, the per pay report bundles in the file archive. So, um, I included that um, uh, JIRA issue number here. So if you'd like to follow it, watch it. Um, but eventually, you know, that is going to be included in the file archives under the per pay report um, option. Okay. 
think we might have had a question. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. All right, perfect. I think I just answered that, Heidi. So you should be all set. And then lastly, um, we added, this is more an internal thing. Um, we added the ability to um, track payroll batch jobs. Um, we added IDs, um, external IDs for all batch processes per payroll. Um, and again, that's that's like an internal behind the scenes database um, thing that was added that's not really visible, you know, and probably not going to be used um, unless there's issues with something um, in the database or errors, you know, this can be used by the developers then to, to identify some, some internal issues that might be going on. Um, lastly, we had several patches then that went out. Um, and basically these were all pertaining to the building and department code changes. So, you know, those are, have, have been a, in the past and um, Mark had sent out messages, you know, alerting you all about, you know, those upcoming changes and the patches that were going to be imply, applied. So we're not going to revisit those this morning because they're, it, it's kind of already, already happened and there's nothing um, going forward that needs to be done. However, um, before we um, end wrap up payroll, I did want to point out a couple things um, regarding the um, release that Mark, I think, just sent out a message about um, just right before our meeting. And that is, um, you know, the making sure that I'll bring up the email here because I did copy it. So we all make sure we're on the same page. Um, it went out on the 30th at 4.13, and it was just um, alerting you that, you know, you do need to be on version 6.91 or higher um, in order for the release today, the 6.93, um, to be um, implemented. So if you didn't get this message, please reach out to us and let us know that you're not getting these messages. Um, again, if you have issues that you're you know not on version 6.90 or higher um, you'll want to reach out to us as well um, right away or um, so that we can help you get up to speed so to speak um, before this um, latest release is um, implemented okay so we all should have gotten that email and then lastly I know it's we're not quite there yet but um, and next Friday, we are going to do a, um, a Fridays with Fiscal of covering the STRS advance and talking, you know, taking a deeper dive into that whole process and the innards of how that's working. But I did want to point out that, um, you know, we did have a new configuration option um, added to the STRS advance configuration, and that's a checkbox that says, you know, you districts, this district processes the advance and checking this box then is going to prevent them from processing a July pay until they've processed their STRS advance submission file. We had so many problems last year with, you know, districts not processing their STRS advance submission file prior to their first pay in July. And even though there's a big old, you know, warning that comes up, um, it, it, you know, I guess it needs to like flash and, you know, send fireworks or something in order for just for users to um, realize what's what, you know, what, what issues that might cause if they just continue and ignore that. So to prevent that from happening, um, there is um, now a checkbox, and by default, this box is checked. So if you go to system configuration, and we go to the STRS advanced configuration, there's a box here, and again, by default, this is checked, that will not allow districts to process their first pay in, in July if that advanced submission file is not created. If you have districts, and I know there are, you know, a few, I don't know, you know, it's not common, but there are exceptions 
if you are have a district that they don't process the advance, then this checkbox will need to be unchecked for them, for those districts. Um, there's nothing for them to file. Um, so again, unchecking this, you know, does some pretty serious damage. So just, you know, make sure that you know, they truly do not need to generate the advance, you know, file, submission file um, before unchecking this box. Okay. All right, I just wanted to point that out before we get too, you know, far into the advanced processing. Um, and we're gonna try to, you know, touch touch on this a couple times so that everybody's on the same page. Okay, let me check the chat here. <laughs> yeah, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> That's funny. Okay, all right, are there any questions? Um, about payroll before I turn it over to Michelle to talk about inventory. All right, okay, I will stop sharing. And I think it should be Michelle. All right, good morning, everybody. Hope everyone can see my screen okay here. I'm going to um, discuss the, in my chat, window up here. Okay, um, I'm going to talk about what has taken place in inventory um, this last month. And uh, we had one uh, hot fix and we had a regular release that went out. And so, and they were all bug related. Um, so I have the information in here. Uh, the first thing um, that we did is we uh, fixed an issue with the gap reports. In particular, I think it was the fixed asset by source and I think one of the uh, summary schedule change in fixed assets, I believe, were the two that we were getting tickets on regarding um, being able to generate the report when there was an acquisition with a blank fund, a function, asset class, or account code. Um, and so we did get that fixed, um, but um, we did get a couple tickets after that um, regarding a particular, the fixed asset by source. Um, still a few little problems, issues with that. So we have created another a JIRA issue 476 to fix those. So that's something I've also put on the radar for our next sprint meeting. Um, in order to get this done before fiscal year end. So um, that is something that's going to be looked at. Um, another one that was um, fixed was a problem with the DOA implementation. It wasn't the performance issue, I don't believe, that USAS and payroll were having. It was an error um, that was being displayed after a successful uh, dual authentication. So that's been fixed now so that it doesn't show that error anymore and it redirects them to the homepage. Of inventory. So that's that's all been fixed. Um, we have had um, uh, we had a couple tickets come in regarding um, the backdating of the beginning depreciation date. Um, the tickets that um, started all of this is they were backdating beginning depreciation dates to a prior year, whereas the acquisition date was in the next year. And um, that was causing some balancing issues. Um, so we went in and made some changes in order to prevent the backdating. Um, we have received a couple tickets since, since then uh, that um, people are getting errors when they go into an existing item, and it might be one that they've had on inventory for a while, and let's say they go in and change the location code. Um, what's happening is um, they get a little flash of an error up at the top. Um, <clears throat> but they're not quite sure what the error is coming from because the location code looks good. If they scroll down, they're going to see that they'll get a message stating, I think I might have a screenshot here, that the depreciation date cannot be before the acquisition date. Well, these tickets that we have received so far, um, it's been where the beginning, beginning depreciation date um, is really in the same month and year but maybe the beginning depreciation date was, excuse me, 7-1-2019, and the acquisition date was 7-20-2019. They're both in the same month. Um, and so 
you know, if you're going in and making a lot of changes to location code and, you know, they're all set up the same way, it's going to get a little annoying, right? Because it's warning you, whereas I don't, you know, feel like that's like that big of an issue where it should be a warning. So we put that on the next sprint to talk about as well as maybe tweaking this a little bit. So, um, you know, if these dates, like in this example, these are definitely different months, but in the example where maybe the beginning depreciation date and the acquisition date have the same month and year, but the day may be different, um, then maybe we can, you know, maybe change that up to be a warning. So um, I have asked the developers about it. So we'll discuss it more in our next sprint and see if we can tweak that a little bit. Um, but yes, so if you're seeing, you know, you're getting questions from your districts, you know, saying, you know, I'm getting an error, but I don't know where the error is coming from, scroll down um, because it's probably the beginning depreciation date that's causing the issue. And, you know, maybe nine times out of 10, they do need to change this because it is, you know, totally different from the acquisition date. Um, you know, that beginning depreciation date should be the same as the acquisition date or after. It should not come before the acquisition date. And that's what we fixed. I don't think Classic checked that. So we made sure um, to get that fixed now so it doesn't cause balancing issues at your end. Um, the book value, uh, we had an issue with uh, when people went and sorted it by location code. Um, there was a uh, a problem was it was excluding those items with the blank location code. Um, so now that's been fixed. It is including them. And those items, when you sort by location code that have a blank one, those will appear at the top of the report. Um, in core fiscal years, um, we have um, made updates so that it does prevent archived periods from being created. Um, so if I go back into my instance here and get out of here. Um, let me go into four school years. So what was happening is that people, you know, this is my migration year. This is the year I came in. Um, so I migrated over in 2020. What was happening is that districts were able to go in and create what we call archived periods, 2019, 2018, 2003. Um, they were going in and being able to create those. And so we have prevented that now so that they can't. Um, and also we disabled it so they can't open or close those periods, those archived years as well. So that's what we did on that release. Um, one little um, thing that we still need to look into regarding that, though, is that I think we had noted on the release notes that it would automatically close those periods as well, and it, that wasn't done on this release. So we do have um, a JIRA issue 484 to fix that as well, so that those archived periods that are showing as open will automatically be set to closed. Um, it's not going to do anything. It's not going to affect um, depreciation or anything like that. We're just changing the status of them to close. So that will be on 484. Um, and the last thing that um, we fixed is there was a change that took place on the hot fix on the 135.2 that um, unfortunately was preventing users from creating new funds and new function codes in core. So we fixed that on the 136 release so that they can go in and create those new codes. Um, so those were the things that were that took place with inventory here in May. Do you guys have any questions regarding these bugs? Okay. Um, just to touch upon a couple of things before um, we sign off here, uh, we do have a couple of Fridays with fiscal sessions here in June. Um, Lori, as she had discussed before, um, we are going to have an SGRS advanced session next week. So next Friday, uh, Lori will be doing that session and going in and talking about balancing tips for SGRS advance. And then the third week of June, June here, Pat is going to go through reviewing of account um, 
account change options and a way to modify account amounts. So she's going to go through all of that. So you know, what we're trying to do here is just kind of focus on specific areas and in going into like a deeper dive into these. So I think these two sessions are good examples of that. Kind of focus it on that this year um, and go through those. And speaking of the SGRS Advance, um, also our newsletter will be out here, hopefully by the end of the day uh, for June, we're trying to get this one out there early uh, because um, it's regarding fiscal year end tips. So we are gonna definitely talk about SGRS um, and just tips on getting things ready, basically for fiscal year end. These are kind of like prepping tools um, for the districts, if you will. And so the first one is covering USPS related and then um, as especially um, in regards to the SGRS. And then um, we are also going to, we're still kind of cleaning this up. So that's why it's in draft mode here um, is we're going to talk about tips for USAS as well. Um, so those are our big two feature articles um, for June. And then we'll have some good site articles as well regarding some fiscal year end related information and other new um, features and enhancements that have taken place here. So lots of good info um, that, you know, we really think will help the districts preparing for fiscal year end. So like I said, hoping to get that out today, if not by Monday, we're getting that out before the first pay <laughs> in June. So um, that'll definitely be out. Um, and I think that's all we have today. So um, thank you. But yes, I think it's going to be a, a really good newsletter. Um, any other questions you guys have? Okay, well, uh, you guys have a wonderful weekend and we will see you guys all next Friday. Thank you.